We talk about that classic Tumbleweed Connection song, Amarina, with Ray Williams. As a matter of fact, Elton John and Bernie Taupin convinced Ray to name his daughter Amarina. And they're her godparents. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. I say this a lot when I interview people, but I really did enjoy talking to Ray Williams, and I'm still in contact with him now. It's a well-known story that Elton John and Bernie Taupin convinced Ray Williams and his then wife to name their daughter Amarina. The song was used in the movie Dog Day Afternoon, and it's a classic track to this day. We talked to Ray Williams about Amarina. Amarina, who's my oldest daughter, who Bernie and Elton name. Did they want to name her because they had written the song? What was the order? Bernie Bernie came up to me and he said, we've got this idea for a song and it's called Amarina. And we wondered if, if you have a little girl, this is before Amarina was born, of course. If you have a little girl, will you call it Amarina? I said, sure. If it was a boy, obviously we couldn't. So we had, you know, little Amarina was born and um, ended up, she was Amarina. So your wife liked the name too? She, uh... Yeah, she, she was Austrian, and so she, uh, <laughs> it was all okay. <laughs> and and Elton became, I know that they, they don't really know each other anymore, but, uh, yeah. uh, which does happen, I don't know my godmother, but but yeah. it, it, it's nice when it works out, but it do, oh, usually yeah. it doesn't. They were the godparents, and, uh, but that didn't happen for, you know, all sorts of reasons, I suppose, you know, you know the whole thing that continued afterwards. Amarina did all right. She's, uh, she became a, a banker. She has two boys. Billy and Sammy, and all that's fine, you know, it's... Uh... Is she the type of person, because I would be, if someone wrote a song, not necessarily about me, but it's still, it's the name, right? Will she share that? Is she the type of person that would... She doesn't outwardly go out and, and, and say it, but sometimes some people say, well, I, that's a nice name, or that's, a, you know, then she'll tell the story. And of course, when the film came out, and Elton had included Amarina in the film, I thought that was really nice. I, I felt a few yeah. olive branches in there, but am I wrong? Yeah, I'd like to think so. I thought the uh, the last the line where he's with um, John Reed, and he said, "Oh, I like Ray. I wish he could join us," you know. And of course, John Reed enters into his thing. But that's uh, John wasn't. Um, I think he got involved with the seventh album as as a manager. But uh, obviously, they 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 became an item. Yeah for a long time and uh yeah so you did you knew john then there was a crossover period like like in the film was well, it I, well i really elton started talking to me about the guy that he, he'd met he'd met elton was going through his had obviously been going through his change of what he was going to be and so that must have been very difficult for him at the same time as appearing at the troubadour i mean he was going through a lot when we went back to England, I remember Elton and I having a... We went for a lunch and we talked about stuff. It was pretty... Uh, you know, I didn't really... You know, I was not cut out to be a heavy L.A. type. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying, uh, you know... I was, it's not how you're it's wired. Not, it's not how I was wired. I like that. We came away with it pretty good. But then it, it turned a little bitter, uh, mainly because there were other influences you know, such as Dick and stuff like that. I've always wanted to ask you this. It's strange. I'm going, you guys are the same age and you're in a position, you're in a much higher position when you meet Elton, but I'm, I'm sure you met a lot of people the same age because that was the ilk. I mean, new artists would have been around that age anyway. You were just lucky that you got in very early, lucky yeah. and talented or all the above. What was it like being dealing with artists that were around just the same age as you, even though you kind of, you were up here? Well, it was... <laughs> It, it it never really fazed me. Occasionally, you'd meet just really unique folks that you. I I always thought Jeff Lynne was a unique. I mean, he was he was younger than me, Jeff Lynne, but he was so normal. He was just so easy to deal with. And then you had extreme people. Extreme. I mean, Mark Bolan was an incredible little guy, unique. He was lovely, but he was different. In what way? And, like in like what? Well, he was just his character. Yeah. I mean, even. He was the, uh, what, what do you call it, little elf. He was like an elf. You know, he was small, and he was, uh, but, he, he was uh, but he was articulate and brilliant. Yeah, I like people like that. So all of the people of that age, we were all having fun. We were in a business that was really a cool place to be. We were in 
swing in London, it, it, it was just all, all very good. And maybe, you know, you look back now and you, and you see, well, isn't that amazing to be in the music business at 16, 17, 18, 19? Most people go to college or, or it just doesn't. People leave school much later now. It's a rock and roll dream when you look at it because kids that age are listening to the music, they're plugged in, they're being influenced by it. It's changing literally the trajectory of their life. And meanwhile, yeah. you're right in the middle of it. But so many people have told me, and Ray, you tell me, that they say, well, I didn't know it at the time. I knew it was exciting, but you know, no one, no one pinches themselves usually when they're 16 and go, oh, don't, don't forget this. But <laughs> No, I just, I realized that I was in a place that was quite exciting. Yeah. You know, in those days, you knew who the members of the band were. You know, everybody, you, you knew that, you know, there was uh, Ray Davis, Dave Davis, Pete Quaife, you, you know, Mick Avery, the drunk. You knew everybody's name. These days, you don't know anybody because everything was different. By the way, I'm as excited about what's going on now as I was then because it's all different. Mm -hmm. And you must never live in the past. So you still have a curious mind. You're still curious. Oh, my God. I love it. I mean, you talked about Manchester. There's an artist there that I kept in touch with for three years now, a guy called James Holt. He was born twenty five with only 25% hearing. And yet this guy is an incredible writer, and I think incredible talent. There's a James Holt here in America, but this is James Holt from Manchester. He's just a unique character. I believe he has something. So I like to, if I see people, uh, you know, a little girl out in L.A. called Alex Ritchie, and it's just young people that I come across, I quite like to see if I can help them because I've always liked new and emerging artists. I love Gus Dudgeon. Uh, in fact, he gave me, when he remastered the live album, and Amarina's on it. He was doing it at Metropolis Studios, and he gave me the first copy to give to Amarino. See, I, I, that's one I missed out on. When when Gus, uh, his wife was with him, right, in the accident? That, uh, didn't it, it, Sheila, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that was... We did a project. He wasn't doing very much, and so there was a girl that I'm from... Where was she from? She was from one of the Baltic countries, and um, uh, the, the girl was called Gintari, G-I-N-T-A-R-E. She was really good. And so I played it to Gus. And Gus said, I really like that. I said, okay, well, uh, let's go and make some records with her. And we did that. And we had a ball. I mean, Gus wouldn't stop talking. He, he's far worse than me. I mean, he's real. I mean, he would go out. You couldn't get rid of Gus. But, but he was just a fund of stories, a lot of fun, and an incredible guy. He used to enjoy his company enormously. And so... We finished the project. He went off one weekend and was driving back, and um, it went off the road, um, and that was the end of it for both of them. Yeah. And they were just lovely, lovely people. And he used to keep his carp in his studio. You know, he had his carp, you know, all the golf, big, massive things. He was very proud of that. And I think Stuart Epps looks after them now. We'll have more from Ray Williams coming up next week. He's an interesting chap, tells a good story, and is still very well connected to the music industry with his publishing website, which is called Crumbs Music. It's all about licensing. It's all about making it easier for you. There'll be a link in the description of this video where you can contact him. More from Ray Williams next week. And remember, buy a t-shirt if you want to support this channel. We're getting some students to come in here and chop up our interview so we can present them to you earlier because there's a backlog of interviews that we just want to get out there. So if you buy a t-shirt, you support us, we get to pay them. <laughs> There'll be links in the description of this video. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos, Twitter, Facebook, whatever group you're in. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.